Greetings all. There have been a very surprising amount of requests for me to cover a TKS, which considering according to YouTube statistics, less than half of 1% of my audience are in Poland is surprising. Either there is a lot of interest in this relatively unique vehicle, or just there's a lot of schadenfreude going around and people want to see whether or not I fit in it. Well, challenge accepted. I have come to Pennsylvania. I'm a little bit east of Gettysburg. This is the Wheels of Liberty collection. The museum itself isn't open yet. Keep an, uh, watch this space or go to their Facebook page for updates. But they have a TKS. Now, I am going to be upfront because it is well known there are not very many TKSs still out and about. This is a replica. It is a one-to-one -one scale down to the bolts being exactly the right size replica and they have had to make two concessions to reality. But otherwise, this is as good to a TKS as you're going to get, at least that I'm going to get to, so away we go. Story starts, 1929, Cardin Lloyd Mark VI. This little tankette was quite popular, started going around the various countries. Uh, you'll see it perhaps in Italian service as a CV-33, well, technically the CV-27 or 29, which developed into the 33, whatever, you get the idea. Uh, other countries ran into them as well. There's one sitting in the Swedish Museum in Arsenal, and I'm sure I'll get to that. And Poland got a couple, and they tested it out, and they liked the idea. Weren't too happy with the ride or a couple of other quirks, but uh, they got in the help of a couple of experts. And since I don't have a word of Polish to me, and I will absolutely murder their names, I'm going to bring in Mike. Mike, come here, please. This is Mike. He speaks better Polish than I do. TK stands for who? Czechak i Karkos. And you think that begins with a CH? No. No. <laughs> what is it? TRZ? TRZ, yep. TRZCIAK. TRZEAK. What he said. Thank you. Go away. <laughs> There's actually a, a, a very enthusiastic staff here, but he speaks the best Polish, so uh, hence that one. So anyway, he, they muck around with a little bit, and they come up with the TK or the TK3, which looks a bit like this, except it has a, uh, a longer front. Uh, but more importantly, compared to the Cardin Lloyd, they've changed the suspension. That was 1930. Come 1933, they're mucking around a little bit more. They improve the vehicle. They give it heavier armor. They make it a little bit more angular, and they also upgrade the engine. Uh, the initial TK3 came with basically a Ford Model A, and the TKS came with a Fiat, or a Polski Fiat, which is basically a Fiat license produced. The, the Model A is a four-cylinder. The Fiat Polski was a six. Suffice to say, the Poles liked it. It entered service, approved. 22nd of February 1934. And so that is the backstory. Now I'm going to make you wait before I go inside this vehicle by giving you the traditional tour, starting as ever at the front. Starting as ever at the front of the vehicle. The armor, as I say, has been improved over the earlier TK3. You now have 10 millimeters on the front where it's sloped six and that includes underneath here the side by the way somewhere approximating eight you'll see that the entire vehicle is simply uh, bolted together so you have nuts on the inside you have these conical bolts on the outside and again the reason that you see these conical bolts on many armored vehicles at the time is that you want to be able to remove them if they get hit by bullets and the conicals Help the, uh, help the bolt be removable after it's been hit. That's not the best way of explaining it, but you get the general idea. Main weapon is the Hotchkiss 7.92 WC25. There you go. Uh, so it's a 7.92 by 57 Mauser, and that was your standard caliber there at the time. So even when the, the poles moved to the 1917 Browning, which they gave the name WC-30. Uh, they also rechambered it to 7.92. We'll come back and talk about that in, in a while. As you come further down, sometimes you might see a light on the right-hand side, the tow hooks. 
are the kind of warthog-like ones that we saw in Sweden. A little bit of stowage on the front. And then, to my surprise, there's actually nothing holding down these access panels so you can get to the differential. And it, it really is just down to what you would expect it to be a little latch. Nope, they decided that simple gravity alone was going to be enough. And then, of course, you have the builder's plate. And now let's have a quick look at the steering, which is a little bit unique. Now, when you first open up the front panels, you're astounded as to just how simple this is. Because ordinarily, you expect to see steering systems, big brake drums and all that. And no, you don't actually. What you do see is a little bit of space for some tools. The main drive housing comes into a simple differential and then the shaft goes outwards with a couple of lubrication points. So the first question comes to mind is, well, how does the steering work? Well, what you can see down here are the two, uh, two shafts which come off the steering wheel. And it's a bit like a French vehicle that the steering wheel, all, all it does is the same thing as Taylor, it's just a different manner. When you steer, you apply pressure to the brake fluid. So there are two reservoirs up down here. Brake fluid comes into these pistons. Pistons then move down these little pipes, one to each side of the vehicle into the brake is basically part of the final drive housing. And that is how this vehicle steers. It simply applies a brake. The differential does what the differential does and power just goes through normal. It's just really just like driving a car except with brake application instead of the changing the direction of the wheels. Otherwise there really is not very much in here. So I'm kind of curious to see what's in the toolbox. Okay, so let's see what we got inside the toolbox. This looks like a handle for a periscope. Flash hider for the Hotchkiss, screws on the end. I guess I'll put it on just to make it look right. My favorite tool on the, tra on the uh, vehicle, we're gonna come back to this. Spare track links. You'll see that they come pre-segmented in fives. And when you're talking about 125 or so, these things on each side, you can understand why perhaps doing track link maintenance on every single link can be a little bit annoying. These are 170 millimeters wide and they have a pitch of 45 millimeters. Now, these particular ones use a cotter pin, but that's not the only way of putting one of these tracks together. And in fact, most of the track on here uses end caps. And then we got a spare radiator cap. A, few, oh, a socket, some of the larger hex bolts. So anyway, not much in here. Let's move on. Actually, now that I come around to the sprocket wheel, I'm going to correct myself. I don't think this has a final drive. And it's just a pure straight drive shaft to keep things simple. And, and I guess it's a light enough vehicle. It may not need the gear reduction ratio. Instead, what it looks like I see here is the brake drum, which also means that it would appear that when you have to replace the brake pads, you got a brake track, pull off the sprocket, and then you can open up the brake drum, which uh, strikes me as being a little bit annoying. So the guys that are driving around here are having a whale of a time. I don't know if they're thinking that far ahead that it's gonna cost them in, uh, in blood and sweat to, to pay for all the driving around and braking that they're doing. Because remember, the only way this vehicle steers is by use of the brake. So, well, there you go. Small catch, but again, all done in the name of simplicity. So as I come around to the left-hand side, oh, by the way, you're gonna see a couple of these hatches scattered around, they will drop down. Uh, the gunner has a couple on each side as well. Get to the suspension, this is the big improvement over the original Cardon Lloyds. Firstly, they've added leaf springs. So the 
Rails here are simply guides. The forward and rear bogies each have a set of guide rails that they go up and down within, suspended by the leaf springs. Each bogey also has the wheel is suspended onto a leaf spring of its own. So there are several levels of suspension. So you got the suspension for the individual wheel on the leaf spring within the bogey. There is the suspension of the bogey coming up to the main leaf spring before then you finally get to the hull. So that's forward and back. The sprocket wheel is your typical early war carrier type of a single row of teeth intermeshing into the middle of the track links. You remember I said this is my favorite tool on the vehicle? It's used for track tension. So the tensioning idler of course is at the rear. It's not quite a trailing idler, it's just a little off the ground but it's going to hit the ground eventually as you go up or down. Tension is maintained by use of a simple ratchet system. There's a ratchet on each side of the idler wheel with a crossbar. So when it is time to tension the track, insert it around the ratchet itself, use your pry bar, that goes into here, start applying a bit of pressure, hammer down on the crossbar, the ratchet will come out, and then you simply lever one way or the other depending on which way you want to go, and then pull up the crossbar back into position so that it locks the ratchet wherever it was. So, I mean, it doesn't look like it'll go much more than a couple of inches. But uh, if you have to stretch this track very much, because there are so many links, uh, you, you're getting to the point that you want to start replacing link or entire track anyway. I do note there is a little bit of lubrication in the middle there. This axle here is a cross beam support. You'll actually see it on the Panzer 1 as well. It goes all the way across inside the hull. And of course, everything is just held together with screws and bolts with little cotter pins to make sure they don't come off in the most inopportune moment. As you come around the back, you see another couple of hatches for vision. You got the exhaust, a spare wheel, loosely mounted, no less. Behind here is going to be the radiator fan system. Again, just gravity holding these down. And you can also see one of the two concessions I mentioned to being a modern vehicle, and that is a modern battery. But then again, even World War II reproductions, they will generally use a modern battery just for safety and convenience. Radiator fan here, as you can see, the radiator is at the rear of the crew compartment. It's drawn from inside, comes back and either out this mesh here or the grill here, or in case of extreme overheating possibility, you can even lower this flap down here and the air will come out in all three locations. What you'll see here is a lack of an engine. You've got to go way back here inside the crew compartment. We're going to have a look at that inside. And the other thing you'll see is a cutout. Uh, they've left the ceiling here, but this should be a cutout for an external hand crank should you wish to crank start the engine instead of using an electrical starter. And again, of course, your tusks. Finally, as we come around to the right-hand side, you have an external mount for a machine gun, should you wish to use one either in the anti-air roll, or should somebody be particularly brave, perhaps they could shoot it from behind the cover of the TKS instead of from within it. Up top, externally, you have your rotating periscope. There are mounts here for some say signal flag, you can use them certainly to throw signal flags up the top. I believe you can also fit a searchlight or spotlight in here should you so desire. The hatches, the commander side is unfortunately a little bit smaller because of the fixed periscope panel to the front. So a little bit stuts forward that way. There's a double hinged flap to the rear. It's still plenty big enough, mind. So now the bit you've all been waiting for do I fit in a TKS? So now the moment you've all been waiting for. Chieftain climbs into a TKS. Or maybe steps in is the better term, we'll see. That's 
really is not bad. Okay, I am now wearing the fashionable Polish helmet with uh, one significant disadvantage. So you've got this ridge at the top here, which of course interferes with your ability to get up higher to look through the periscope, uh, which I would say is a flaw, but I guess you've got to look nice as you're rolling through the countryside in your TKS. The periscope to the front is, as mentioned, completely rotatable. Now, after about the 55th vehicle, they changed the periscope to a new design, which in British service would be known as the AFV periscope number four, Mark IV, something like that. And what that had was had a second piece of glass down below and an extra mirror. So once you rotated yeah, the, uh, the periscope to the rear, you would use a second optic, and that way you could see straight behind you without having to do any strange contortions inside the vehicle. Now, that said, this purely is a left and right right now, in this particular mount at least, there doesn't seem to be a facility for elevation. It may just be because of the replica uh, that was used, but maybe not. Either way, vision out is, as you can imagine, completely atrocious, especially if you're bouncing around, because although I am actually quite comfortable in here, there's nothing really to hold on to except the Hotchkiss, which, well, ordinarily I wouldn't complain too much because I'm, although my legs have all the room in the world and I'm a little bit tight, so I'm not going to get thrown around side to side, not uncomfortably so, but uh, still I'm cozy. What concerns me is the fact that to my left is the engine and the engine is completely at least in this vehicle, unshielded from the rest of the crew. And if you are not wearing long sleeves, you are going to burn yourself if you're thrown against it, which I would argue to be a flaw. To see out, there is no end of these little hatches that I've mentioned before. And you just unlatch the lock, go forward and it locks in place. So it's, it's not an entire swivel out like you would expect with a hinge. The hinge is actually, the pivot point is on the inside which is kind of clever as well. Uh, it keeps it more secure from enemy fire. You have the various holes and ports around here that you can throw your signals flags out of. They were nice enough to leave a document rack on the right hand side with either the operator's manual, oh, read before starting, uh, or maps or things like that. Radios were not really a thing, unfortunately, in the TKS. To us front, that Hotchkiss 25792, as already mentioned, 1,900 and, as I recall, 20 rounds would be uh, carried. Now, the ammunition's a little bit odd. The, uh, the original Hotchkiss came with clips, uh, but in order to get enough rounds to fit in the TKS, they've mounted them on hinged semi-rigid, so it's three rounds per link of clip, which, of course, you'd have to fold a certain way to make sure that you could still pull these through the machine gun. So you'd feed the little handle through and then pull until you're able to load the gun. So it's a little bit unusual. The downside, of course, is as it's not a disintegrating link, all these little panels are falling down on the right-hand side and getting you in your way. On the other hand, it also means that cleaning up the link afterwards is very easy. Left feed, there was a telescopic sight. So in addition to the periscope, for actual aiming, there is a telescopic sight, and if things go haywire, there is enough of a gap to the front that the old-fashioned iron blade sights complete with adjustable range was also an option. But other than the fact that he can't see anything, he's overworked, and he's half an inch away from getting his arm burned off, this isn't actually a bad position to be in. I mean, if the alternative is rolling around on foot or on a horse or something like that, well, I, I guess maybe you could see the argument for the horse. But uh, actually, oh, they do lock into place, it seems. There's little, little latches here that can be used to secure yourself in. There you go. Um, communication. I have to assume was done by yelling because you don't have too far to communicate anyway. 
So maybe if we get this thing going a little bit later, we'll, uh, we'll see what the noise levels are like. So now to talk about the engine. In the middle is that second concession I'd mentioned to there being a modern vehicle. Now, the TKS, as mentioned, had the Polsky Fiat, which was a six-cylinder cranking out 46 horsepower. Unfortunately, they're a little bit hard to come by. So, as mentioned, the predecessor vehicle to the TKS, the TK, or sometimes also TK3, had the Ford Model A engine. And that's what they put in this. It is a four-cylinder, cranks out 40 horsepower. Now actually the, the earlier TK was faster than the TKS even though it had a little bit less uh, power but it also had a lot less uh, a lot less weight to haul around with less armor. Behind me of course is the fuel tank as already mentioned 69 liters get you about 180 kilometers on the road 110 or so off the road according to the specs and the filler port is up top which you would access by opening up the rear view panel. So that is it on the commander's side. I have to say, I have no particular complaints about it. I mean, I could stay here for quite a while as long as I don't get thrown around too much. But uh, let's see if the driver is as comfortable as the TC is. Right, once you're in, I've been in worse. And actually, because I broke my microphone getting in that first time, I've uh, had to get in and out. And I think I got it right the second time. You got to sort of swivel right a little bit to clear your hips, come down beneath this uh, part of the carburetor, I think it is, and then you can slide forward and twist back the right direction. Not ideal, but okay. Uh, vision to his front is a small little slit. Now, it would be possible to have an actual periscope as well, so it's not a direct uh, open to the wide world, but there would actually be some glass in between you and everything else who's facing forward. Obviously not mounted here. It does open up in the same manner as the as the last ones. Just simple forward, lock into place by use of this little lever down here. They give me a little bit of padding on the left hand side. I don't know why they felt uh, the need for such creature comforts, but on the right hand side, which as I said, the engine is right up close to me. Uh, there is a shielding. So unlike the TC, there's a bit of a gap. Leg room. I've been in worse. The seat is basically a cushion on the whole floor, same as the TC side. There's a small little drain port down here. Pedals, well, they're pretty much conventional. Clutch on the left, brake in the middle, and accelerator on the right. The accelerator actually has a roller to make it easier for your foot to slip off, which is a little inconvenient. Uh, but also, it, it does mean it's actually very easy to drive if you're not using a lot of pressure. Steering wheel, what it really is, is just performs the same, as mentioned, the same function as the tillers, except instead of having to leave space on each side for your tiller, it's a single uh, shaft in between the legs, which doesn't really get in the way. So it is a bit of a space saver, even if perhaps you get a little bit less leverage. But remember how this works. As you turn the wheel, all you're doing is moving this lever forward to activate the pistons down here for the brake fluid and the spare reservoirs that mentioned for the brake fluids are up here. As you move a bit further around to the right there is a very simple dash with fuel amperage and temperature, ignition key in the middle, another slight modern modification. As you move to the right hand side, now remember this is uh, based off of the Model A powertrain not the actual uh, Fiat uh, Polsky Fiat from the TKS. The Model A's came with a three-speed transmission, one reverse. The TKS actually came with a four-speed transmission, one reverse. Uh, it's The engine shielding does kind of get a little bit in the way, but it's tolerable. Down and forward is the choke, and you can see the drive shaft just goes straight forward. So outside of the noise, not too bad. Yeah, the transmission, of course, is located just back here. Uh, he won't be bouncing around too much. As you move around to the right, well, we have the air intake is over the uh, left shoulder. Comes in here to the carburetor and then in. Behind me, you can see the coolant reservoir for the radiator, which is directly beneath me. Directly beneath, you're going to see a hole in the floor. And this is a hatch for two purposes. Firstly, it is increased cooling air, especially if your hatches are shut up top that can be drawn up into the radiator 
and then out the back. Also, if this thing was converted for rail car service, which was a thing, various mechanisms for rail car usage would have gone through the uh, hatchback here and then to the rail car system. Hopefully there is actually a cover for this hatch, there doesn't seem to be one on this particular vehicle, otherwise the fording depth of 5 centimeters is going to result in the crew getting a little bit damp. Which is unfortunate, it kind of sucks to be wet in an armored vehicle, I don't know if you've ever tried it, you think it's bad being outside the armored vehicle, inside it's pretty horrible. So outside of that, uh, top speed is mentioned about uh, 40 kilometers to the hour. Uh, it's got another hatch to the rear. And there really isn't anything else in here. So what I'm going to do now, because everybody wants me to do it, is close up the hatches and see how long it takes me to get out. Okay, I have now sealed myself in. There is a number of latches in the top here. There's a broken weld up here, so I'm going to have to be a little bit careful opening it up so I don't break the tank yet any more than I need to. But in the time-honored manner, oh bugger, the tank is on fire. Two. Or not. Additional one. Okay, now people do always complain that I don't necessarily make the best test subject for the tank is on fire test. So I have enlisted the help of two volunteers who are perhaps a little more typically sized for your average by today's standards undernourished Polish soldier. So without any further ado, let's see what happens with two shorter people trying to get out of a TKS. Oh bugger, the tankette is on fire. They had more practice than I have, that's for sure. So there you go, the TKS by popular demand. Now, for a 1930s vehicle, this really isn't bad at all. I mean, I can fit in it, I can operate it, and of course you saw how quickly the smaller folk got out. About 500 were made, a little over, and famously about two dozen, a little under, were converted to have a 20 millimeter anti-tank cannon. However, they were the rarity. The vast majority came with this machine gun. Export sales were limited. Estonia bought six. That was at any other you see in Hungarian or Soviet or German service. Well, they were all captured the spoils of war. Finally, two shout outs. Firstly, to the Wheels of Liberation collection. I, I did say Liberty at the beginning, that was wrong, and I'll put a link to their Facebook page down below. And also to the Patreons who have funded this trip. Thank you for your support. Right, hope you found the video interesting and informative. I'll see you on the next one. Move out! You'll see that the track links come in segments. When there's something approximating 140, I have to look it up, of these track, li track links. Start again. I'm going to look up how many track links there are. Otherwise, again, lots of empty space. That single crossbar I mentioned earlier, which supports the frame. And you can barely see on the right hand side here the fuel tank, which will get the vehicle, uh, I seem to recall it's about a 65 liter tank. And I can't remember, and I gotta go look it up now. Okay, so 
pointing at the audio recorder had something to do with that. But it's still cozy. At least I have a heat shield on this side. But the vast majority kept with this regular machine gun. And for a 1930s vehicle, this really isn't a bad design that even I can operate and crew. Now, of course, don't get me wrong, this is not a tank, don't mistake it for a tank. It was actually acquired as a reconnaissance or cavalry vehicle, but it did prove to be the bulk of the Polish armed, uh, armored forces at the 